put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. I can understand skeptics because I was a skeptic myself. And when it comes to the story of Jonah, which is an incredible story, the science of archaeology has shown that an incredible story can become credible. My friend Francois Duplessis made a study of the prophet Jonah, and he's going to tell us how this incredible story became credible. Thank you, Walter. It's exciting. We'll start with the city of Nimrud today, called Nimrud in Iraq. It was the biblical Kala. You read about the city in Genesis chapter 10. The other city we want to visit is uh, Korsabat, ancient Dur Sharkin. Uh, this was a tremendous discovery. They were digging for Nineveh and they came upon Korsabat. And here they discovered it's the, the palace of Sargon II. He was the Syrian king who exiled the Israelites in 722 BC. Tremendous story. And his name is only mentioned once in uh, Isaiah 20 verse 1. They thought he didn't exist. Archaeology said, yes, the Bible is true. You can believe it. And of course, Nineveh is a tremendous city. It was destroyed in 612 by three kings, Nabopolassar, uh, Saacheres, and King Nebuchadnezzar. And this city disappeared for almost three millenniums. The city of Ashur is a place that I really enjoyed visiting because before every battle campaign, the king would come here and ask the god of Ashur, the god of war, can we go to war? And he would say yes. But then something strange happened during the time of Jonah and the king Adatnerari III. A moratorium was placed on war in the Assyrian annals. Now Jonah 3 verse 4 says, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. You have to be honest when you preach the gospel, Walter. It's not just grace, grace, grace. It's repentance, repentance, repentance as well. There should be a balance. And the Bible says something interesting. Verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God, Yahweh, and proclaimed a fast. They were touched and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. This is genuine repentance. Verse 6 says, for word came unto the king of Nineveh, Adatnirari the third, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. From a throne to ashes. I like this. He became a monotheist, says archaeology. Jonah 3, 7. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. This was a genuine repentance. Verse 8 and 9. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let every one call urgently on God, monotheism, not polytheism. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. From an Assyrian king. This is exciting. Jonah 3 verse 10 says, When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. This is a picture of God. What a beautiful picture. Now if God could change cruel Assyrians into kind Assyrians, he can do the same for you and me. The king got converted with his people. God specializes in bad sinners, changing them into 
good, kind Christians. God bless you as you penetrate deeper into the truth of this marvelous book. God bless. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Every generation on earth has wondered whether the Lord would come in their time. I believe that in this time in which we are living, the signs of fulfilling which were foretold in the Bible, they would occur just before the coming of Jesus Christ. What are the signs of His coming? And how can we glean the whole picture from this story? The Bible says in Matthew 24, 3-5, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And notice the first thing that Jesus answers. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed, that no man deceive you. Deception will be one of the most important things at the end of time. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. There is only one Messiah, the prophecies point to Jesus Christ, but many would come claiming to be Messiahs. Matthew 24, 23 to 7 continues the warning, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christs, false prophets, show great signs and wonders, and if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, when they say, Behold, he's in the desert, or he's in the inner chamber, don't go, because we know that he will come with power and great majesty and glory and every eye will see him. There will be none of this clandestine story. Today we could add a sentence perhaps, when they say he's on television, don't believe them. That's what the Bible says. If we look at all the God-men in the world today who claim to be the source of light and all knowledge and salvation, then the world is filled with them. Here we have the promised God-man is here, Rushiva Avatar Adida Samraj, who lives in uh, this relative luxury, claiming to be one of the modern-day messiahs. Devotees bowing down to him as he enters into this entryway. He claims of himself, I have always pers persisted in being a lover only. That is my genius that I bow, I got to realize most perfectly. It is not enough to pursue realization as a relief from suffering. Realization must be of that which certainly is not suffering. And then he claims, I am the avatar of brightness. The way of Adidam is not about seeking to be relieved of suffering. It is about happiness. It is about being in love with me. All as a condition of taking refuge in me are obliged to fall in love with me. And having accepted this in love, one can no longer say that life is suffering. It is not merely that. And here we have one of these God-men claiming to be the avatar of brightness. There are God-men and God-women on the planet. All of them have been pervaded with the spark of divinity, which is basically pantheism. God is in all of us. A very famous lady, Amrita Amanda Mai, commonly called Ama, here she receives a reward on the occasion of a global peace initiative of women religious spiritual leaders. Also, she has been able to speak at the United Nations. And these God examples of people on the planet are what we are seeing in the world more and more and more. This is Amma's UN address. There is one truth that shines through all creation, rivers, mountains, plants, animals, sun, moon, stars, you and I. All are expressions of this one reality, this religion of pantheistic fusion, where everything is God and everything becomes God and we are God. It is by assimilating this truth in our lives and thus gaining a deeper understanding of that, we can discover the inherent beauty in this diversity. Everybody believes the same thing really at the essence. Come together, come together. Christ says, come out and be separate. When we work together as a global family, not merely belonging to a particular race, religion, nation, peace, happiness will once again prevail on this earth, which is drenched with the tears of division and conflict. 
Well, Jesus says, I have not come to bring peace upon the earth, but a sword. There will be division. And either he is the Messiah or he's not the Messiah. When we work together as a global family, not merely belonging to a particular race or religion, the Bible says there is only one truth and only one way. Here was another God-man, the Avatar Mehe Baba. He is now deceased. Another one that died in 1990, Osho. Great following of people believing in this God-man who rode round in numerous Rolls Royces and lived in luxury until he died. Then modern messiahs, Jim Jones or the modern Russian, Russian messiah, Marie Devo Christos, all of them claiming to be divinities in this day and age. And even from the mainstream religious world, we have God-men today who represent God in a particular fashion. The Dalai Lama, for example, here is the abbot in his reincarnated and present form. Time magazine says the Dalai Lama, Tibet's exiled God King. So we have God men upon this world. And uh, various religions claim to have God men as their leaders. Here we have the founder of the Hare Krishna movement, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, and he also claims to be at the divine grace, the divine grace, the God-man amongst us. So these swamis like Swami Dehendra, who is the swami for the upper echelon of society, or His Holiness Maharashi Mahesh Yogi, all of them claiming to be God-men. Or Sri Sataya Sai Baba, this German inscription says, Zweimal täglich erscheint der Allmächtige Gott, Almighty God appears before the people. And people worship in their thousands, in their millions. The Baha'i religion was also started by a divine one, a promised one, a coming one. The Baha'i faith was founded in 1844 by Baha'u Allah, linking the faith with the Baha'i faith founded by the Bab. Bab meaning gate. Here are these Bab, as the Bab. Bab meaning gate. Jesus says, I am the door, no one comes to the Father except by me. But here are other gates whereby we can come. And these are people who claim that they have divinity within themselves. And the world is being prepared for the coming of another one, the Lord Maitreya, who is known to Christians, so they say, as the Christ, and in the Orient as the Bodhisattva, the Mohammedans as the Iman Mahdi, and then as the Sri Krishnas or the world teacher. Every religion waiting for one common Messiah to come and satisfy them all. For there shall arise false Christs, false prophets, and they shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Matthew 24, 24. Here we have the appearance of the Maitreya as he appeared. Um, even they photographed him on by the television series, Maitreya, as he miraculously appeared before thousands outside Nairobi in 1988. He has a particular spokesperson on this planet through whom he channels his information. This man is Benjamin Cream. He's a British artist and longtime student of esoteric philosophy, and he claimed that this world teacher was in the world already and would announce himself at a particular time in his uh, article in, in Share International. By the way, these articles are part of a system of education which is even propagated at the level of the United Nations. The world emerges, all the great religions posit the idea of a future revelation to be given by a future teacher. Christians hope for the return of the Christ, the Buddhists look for the coming of another Buddha, the Lord Maitreya, Muslims await the Iman Mahdi, the Hindus the reincarnation of Krishna, and the Jews the Messiah. And uh, all of these are supposed to be wrapped into one. In 1982, his Tara Center took out a full-page advertisement and published that this was now an eminent event to take place. He claimed, uh, as quoted here by Kamni in The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow, that revitalized Christian churches as well as Masonic lodges will be used for purposes of giving mass planetary initiation. So the whole world must be swept into this new euphoria which will be realized when this Maitreya comes. The reception of the Maitreya by the Master, Benjamin Cream writes, Maitreya is known 
knows that when he steps forward into the world arena, a mixed reception will be forthcoming from humanity. There are many who look forward to that moment with joyful expectation who will see it as the beginning of the new time which awaits the sons of men. There are others, however, understanding little of the meaning and process of his advent, who will look askance and doubt his credentials, fearfully aware of the scriptural warnings which they all too readily misinterpret. Well, the scriptures are very clear. When the Lord Jesus comes, he will not appear on television or make himself known here or there in little inner rooms. He will come with power and great majesty. They cannot be misinterpreted. And he, they claims that well, the sword of cleavage will do its work, revealing those who stand for freedom and justice, for practical goodwill and love. It seems as if you do not accept these Matreas and these Christs that appear all over the world, then you will be looked at sconce at by the world out there. The time has come to begin the process of change to transform the life of men in such a way that the God in man shines forth. Well, this was the language of the serpent. You will be as gods. This is not scriptural. So if Matreya is trying to show us our own godhood, well, then we have to be afraid of him. New teachings of the Christ... Theology is usually useless and arguments of the scripture is wasteful energy. Simply take the theme of loving and live it. This is the new theology, the love religion, negating the justice of God. Man does not live by bread alone, but by, what does the Bible say? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. So it's not useless to talk about these things. Let us look at this interview with Benjamin Cream. So... Sometime between now and maybe June, July, I personally, it could be right or wrong, I personally expect the appearance of Maitreya on, first of all, American television, and then Broadway. Could I, on behalf of the BBC, invite Maitreya to make an appearance on national television? You could make the request. Uh, He's, as I said, he's accepted the American, he's accepted the Japanese, which would follow it. You would be third in line. Well, while we're here, could you ask Matreya why television is so important? Why does, why does he do it in this way? For the first time in human history, the world teacher can come and speak directly to everybody. He doesn't need religious organizations, priests, intermediaries who do nothing but to start the teaching. That's what all the religions have done throughout the ages. For the first time, he can come and speak directly man to man, man to woman, heart to heart. And humanity can then make up its mind. But surely it's the good of the world, the quicker it happens. Oh, it. yes, but, you know, the Japanese will be immediately after the American, and you'll be immediately after the Japanese. Well, it seems that uh, the television stations must prepare for the coming of Maitreya. The Bible says he will come with power and great glory. Every eye will see him. Nowhere do I read that he will be on television. Mysterious crosses appeared when he first made his appearance. And uh, he looked just like a Messiah would look, as one would expect it, with the beard, the white robe. His religious symbols that he uses include the religions, symbols of all the great religions of the world, whether it be Islam, Christianity, Judaism, or Buddhism, all of them incorporated in one system. Maitreya has appeared in 1988 in Nairobi, and there he walked amongst the people, many were healed, and uh, the television stations of the world said he appeared and then he disappeared as a mystic. He healed the people, the people bowed down, they worshipped him. And since then he has made his appearances all over the world in inner chambers. Then he also appeared on public television, the television screens they said switched themselves on in some areas of the United States and in other areas of the world. And Jesus stars on American television, the tabloids predict it. And we read about his appearances in 1998, and we see Cyprus, Iceland, Argentine, Bolivia, all the countries of the world appearing to little groups here and little groups there. Quebec, Canada, Algeria, Argentine, here, there. What does the Bible say? When you hear he's here or there, do not believe them. In 1998, he appeared to in Croatia, in Poland, in Sudan, in China, to little groups of 100, 200, 150 worshippers, Christians, Muslims, fundamentalist Christians, the whole plethora. 
He appeared in Switzerland, Morocco, all of these countries, always to a few here and a few there. What does the Bible say when he's in an inner room here or do, in another room there? Do not go. His appearances in 2001 were in Argentine, Brazil, India, Poland, China, New Zealand, mainly to Buddhists and Christians and some Islamic groups. And he appeared in 2002 for the last time. Now comes the great initiation. The Bible says, beware of these things. Now one of the great thinkers of our time was Teilhard de Chartin, who was a Jesuit. And uh, he dreamed of humanity merging into God and each realizing his own godhood at the Omega point. And this great teacher, often quoted in the New Age circles, claims that uh, all are waiting for a coming cosmic Christ. And he's uh, often quoted by New Age occultists in the world today. And he wrote in his work, on Christianity and evolution, a general convergence of religions upon a universal Christ who satisfies them all. That seems to me the only possible conversion of the world and the only form in which a religion of the future can be conceived. He's absolutely right. If we want peace on this world and religious unity on this world, then we have to concentrate on a universal Christ that satisfies them all. But the Bible Christ is so exclusive He's the only way by which we can be saved. He's the only one who fulfills the prophecies. And if we cling to one, then we will have strife in all eternity, says Teilhard de Chardin. So we will have to sacrifice him in order to have peace. Well, maybe that price is too high to pay. Signs of his coming, there will be war and distress of nations, says the Bible. And we read it in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. There will be earthquakes. Yes, it will be as it was in the days of Noah. The gospel shall be preached worldwide. There will be tribulation. And there will be false Christs. All of these factors we have in the world today. Signs in the sun and the moons and the stars... We've had these as well on our planet already, as we will see in a later lecture. And Jesus said unto them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, there shall not be left here one stone on another. There shall be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of the coming and of the end of the world? We see these signs fulfilling before our very eyes. The destruction of of Jerusalem and the temple are just symbols of a greater destruction that will take place at the end of time in our time. The symbols were carried away and in the same way the symbols of Christianity and all of these issues will come under attack in a world that seems bent on destruction. Matthew 24, 7 says, For the nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Now here's an interesting point. The words nation against nation in the original is ethnos against ethnos. So we can say ethnic group against ethnic group. We see this in the world today more than at any other time. Christ wants us to unite on the principles of love and the principles of forgiveness that we have in the Bible. But there seems to be tension between ethnos and ethnos in the world today. Kingdom against kingdom, that's political entity against political entity. So strife within a nation, strife between the nations. And that's exactly what we can see in the world today. Your gold and silver have corroded and their poison will be as a witness against you and will eat your flesh as fire. You heap treasure in the last days, says James 5 verse 3. So there will be economic turmoil in the world today. Behold the hire of your laborers which you have reaped down your fields which is of you kept back by fraud crieth and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. There will be labor disunion in the final days. And do we have that? Absolutely. Jobs in an age of insecurity, worklessness, poverty, extreme wealth, extreme poverty, pain everywhere in the world, and dissension growing in the minds of men. 
2 Timothy tells us about the state of the world in the last days. And we know these texts well. In the last days there will be perilous times. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, etc. We know these texts. Switch on the television. And this is exactly what we see from morning till night. And then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Matthew 24.10 I believe we are on the verge of these things happening in the world today. And soon there will be a turmoil because that is what the Bible says. People have no regard for anyone else's lives. Like here with this gas poisoning that took place in Japan in the public transport system. These are ongoing issues in the world today. The love of many will grow cold. There is no regard for human life. It is sad to see. Violence, 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 say the headlines. There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that same time, said Daniel 12 verse 1. Surely we are heading for these final events that the Bible has been speaking about. The earth shall become old like a garment. What an amazing statement by the prophet Isaiah, chapter 51, verse 6. And if we look at the earth and we hear about global warming and uh, El Nino occurrences and destruction of the world's forests and all these things that are coming upon the world, then surely we can look at it and say, wow, it's becoming worn out like an old garment. Torching the Amazon, can the rainforest be saved? These are ecological issues which are headline news every single day of our lives. Der Spiegel says, vor uns die Sintflut. In other words, in, before us, ahead of us, the flood, Noah's flood. We are heading for another disaster. The sea of tears for Neptune, the polluted waters, the animals dying, all of these issues. Mega hurricanes, stormy forecasts. Powerful windstorms such as, as the world has not realized and seen as frequently as we see them now. Mega destruction, mega storms with El Nino occurrences, breaking up continents, changing the, the environment. This is rather ironic. Here, one of these storms and the waves crash through and we see mayhem and destruction with a sign in the background. Jesus loves you. Jesus does love us, but he has warned us that this would be the condition in the last days. So instead of rebuking him, perhaps we should do some introspection. Here we can see some of these destructive forces of nature, these vehicles smashed into the urban environment. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture, yea, the flocks of the sheep are made desolate. O Lord, to thee will I cry, for the fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame has burned all the trees of the field. Joel 1, 18 and 19. Never in a time before have we had so many fires sweeping through urban areas, destroying what is left because we have such extremes in the environmental uh, conditions today. Mega cold, mega hot, mega water, mega drought. Everything is moving towards extremes. With the last great El Nino occurrence, this was the condition of the Australian continent. The land less milk and honey. The animals were dying of starvation, just as the Bible said it would happen. It was a horrendous sight and the fires that swept across some of these ultra dry areas devouring everything before its place. The Bible says there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places, Matthew 24, 6 and 7. We'll be dealing with some of these issues when we return. Put the puzzle together piece by piece and discover the whole truth. Put the puzzle together piece by piece and discover the whole truth. 
Bible says men's hearts will be failing them for fear for what is coming upon the earth. Well, when we look at the pestilences and the earthquakes predicted in the Bible, people will say, well, there have always been earthquakes, but not such as we have now. We have a totally new situation on our planet. The forces of the winds have increased, the frequency of the hurricanes has increased, whereas in the past you would have one of these on a yearly basis or maybe every three, four, five years. Now you have a number of them in one year. Hurricane Katrina caused such havoc. And uh, here we have a little clip of what happened in that particular disaster. The mayor of New Orleans, Ray Nagin, is on his way to take the measure of the misery in the worst American disaster in a hundred years. Most of his city has surrendered to the sea. The streets of the Big Easy are now subject to the tides of the Gulf of Mexico. Every person is here by order to immediately evacuate. The Two days before the storm, Nagan ordered the biggest evacuation in U.S. history. Even now, some people remain trapped. There's some people up there by that blue. On our flight, Nagan noticed a man marooned and delivered the aid himself. When you were looking at your city from the helicopter today, Mayor, I had, I had the sense that your heart was broken. You know, my heart is broken, and you know, it's, um, it's a tough thing. When you see a city that you love so much, and you see it so devastated and so almost dead, and you wonder what the future looks like. There would be earthquakes in various places, says the Bible. Well, earthquakes have increased as time has progressed. Each year we have 6,000 major earthquakes in the world. And structures which were believed to be indestructible are collapsing. One of the mega disasters that the world has realized in the recent past was this terrible destruction in Sri Lanka, where we had this seismic event in the ocean which caused this mega wave known as a tsunami. In India, 6,600 killed, 10,000 plus killed. In Sri Lanka, Thailand, 866 killed. Indonesia, 5,000 killed. What a disaster. The world has never seen such things on such a mega scale before, all concentrated into a short period of time in the time in which we are living. Tsunami horror, the wall of water dwarfs a tourist and boat on the beach. These photographs, some of them were taken by people who died in this tsunami and the cameras were recovered and developed. And this is what we see, this mega wall of water coming towards the, the land. The destruction was unbelievable. Whole buildings submerged, busloads of people submerged. It was a horrendous disaster. And if we look at the headlines and the news, it seems as if people are preparing for the next and the next and the next. Again, there was another earthquake. It didn't create uh, destruction on the land, but it created tsunamis. And people are afraid. They do not know what is coming upon the world, just as the Bible predicted. And what did it leave behind? Destruction unparalleled, unbelievable, whole areas removed as though they had never existed. These are satellite images of Thailand before and after the destruction. The picture on the left shows the coastline before the tsunami and the picture on the right the coastline after the tsunami. It's as if it had been eradicated. When we come to pestilences, the Bible predicts that in the last days there will be pestilences and famines and diseases. Now, some will argue, but there have always been pestilences and there have always been diseases. We are dealing with a new situation such as has never been on the planet before. Something that science is unable to even address with their best methodologies. We are seeing new kinds of diseases. 
bad blood, the AIDS epidemic that is sweeping across the world. Here we have a retrovirus that splices itself into the genetic system, becomes part of you and you cannot fight yourself. And so you have this terrible plague just wiping out people. Hard to swallow. The animals have become antibiotic resistant through the long use of antibiotics over time. And new diseases are spreading from animal to humans. Ostrich meat, the Ebola virus scare. We are moving from one scare to the other. And then strange and wonderful diseases. Mad cow's disease, a prion disease. A protein, a modified protein that causes the demise of the nervous system and the collapse and deterioration of the nerve cells so that the brain becomes like a sponge, a spongy for disease. It's not a virus, it's not a bacterium, it is a tiny protein. It is virtually impossible to fight once this disease has taken hold. So strange and marvelous things are happening. When these diseases struck, they thought, well, it would only affect those who are old or who have long exposure to these things. But here we see little babies with Kreutzfeldt-Jakob syndrome, the human equivalent of these diseases. The brain of a 17-year-old destroyed part of the portions of it with this terrible demise. And then other interesting things. The death on the farms, an outbreak of foot and mouth disease raises new questions about Europe's food. The destruction of hundreds of thousands of animals in the world just subject to these diseases. Now we've always had these diseases, but there's an interesting change that is taking place in the world. You know, viruses used to be very, very species specific. That means they would be retained within their particular species and didn't easily cause cross-specific uh, infections. But that seems to be changing. Within the animals over time, there has developed a resilience. And now viruses seem to jump the species barrier. And so even foot and mouth disease can now infect humans and give a kind of simple influenza type uh, disease. But others are more virulent, and more dangerous. For example, the bird flu fears that are sweeping across the world today. Time magazine picks this up. And what is the issue here? Why is it such a big deal? You see, bird flu used to be confined to birds. But now, they are jumping the species barrier, and particular strains have appeared. Now, it seems as if a similar thing might have happened in the past. The influenza epidemic that happened in 1918 it is claimed to have killed 20 million and perhaps as many as 50 million people that have died in that 1918-1990 pandemic. But today, the situation has changed. The system of transport, the way in which viruses can be transformed, transported from one continent to another, all of these issues have changed. Scientists said that the disease in 1918, which also infected up to a billion people, then half the world's population leapt to humans by mutating from bird's flu. So there's a precedent already. If it happened once, it could happen again. In this current outbreak of this disease, when it started occurring in Hong Kong in 1997 and in 2003, and then again in 2005, there were 18 cases reported, six people died in Hong Kong. Then in 2003, there were two cases, one death. Again, in 1999, two cases. In 2003, one case. And we see that the death rate is about 50%. So if a pandemic like this would occur on the planet today, well, then it is supposed that millions upon millions of people could die. The virus in question, the virulent one, is of the H5N1 strain. And this virus has popped up all over the world. And so people are gripped in fear. It first started off in Asia Minor. They thought they could contain it, but it spread to all parts of the world, to the north of Europe, 
we have these strains of viruses, H5N1, H5N2, now in Canada, in Norway, in southern Africa, and the birds, the migratory birds, are the ones, of course, who are most apt to carry this all over the world. Asia, Asia sickens a time special report on the avian flu outbreak reveals how hard it will be to put this genie back in the bottle. We are living in interesting times. Instances of avian influenza infections in humans, confirmed instances of avian influenza viruses infected humans since 1997 include the H5N1 virus, in Hong Kong, avian influenza, again it was the H5N1 virus. So this virus seems to be culprit number one at the moment. During this outbreak, 18 people were hospitalized, six of them died. To control the outbreak, authorities killed 1.5 million chickens to remove the source. You cannot be everywhere at the same time. Symptoms of the avian influenza. The reported symptoms are typical influenza-like symptoms ranging from uh, fever, cough, sore throat, muscle aches, eye infections, then pneumonia, acute respiratory distress, viral pneumonia, other severe life-threatening complications. And these things are upon the world. No wonder the Bible says men's hearts failing them for fear. Dr. Klaus Storr, who coordinates the World Health Organization's Global Influenza Program, predicted more than a quarter of the world's estimated 6.4 billion population would fall ill from influenza. The Asian H5N1 strain of the virus was, quote, certainly the most likely one that will cause the next pandemic, Storr said. Now, whether he is right or whether he is wrong is irrelevant at this point. The fact of the matter is that these things are upon us. And this is something that has never been before. Because we were always safe hiding behind our species barrier. And that is no longer the case. We now have to watch out how the viruses go from birds to man, from cattle to man, from pigs to man. And we are living in a totally new environment. We don't know where to protect ourselves. Some viruses splice themselves backwards into our DNA like the AIDS pandemic and uh, become part of us. How do you fight yourself? This is a totally new ball game. The Bible says there will be wars and rumors of wars. People will say there have always been wars. But on a global scale such we have, as we have now, I mean, even in the European wars, not all the nations were involved. But now it seems as if war and terror and fear has spread and become a global component. This has never been before. You heard about a war here and you heard about a war there. Even in the world wars, there were about 50 odd nations involved of all the nations in the world. But today, no nation is safe anymore. So there will be wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. We are living in very interesting times. This past century has been the bloodiest century of them all. If we look at the mega explosions that took place, the mega loss of life, the atomic race that is taking place in the whole world, even today new nations constantly being added, and some nations trying to fend off this expansion in the nuclear programs of the world. Modern estimates place the number of deaths from World War I and World War II at 69 million military and civilian personnel. I mean, that is a horrendous loss of life. More people have been killed by war in the past hundred years than in all of the other wars on Earth's history combined. This should tell us something. We are living in the time of the toes, the time of the clay and the iron, a time of turmoil such as the world had never seen. It's fascinating that uh, George Bush in an interview claimed, I'm invested with a divine mission to promote the biblical worldview on the policy carried out by the United States of America. This was an, an interview on the Passionate Eye CBS television documentary, The World According to Bush, on October 22, 2004. Now, 
This is fascinating. The world seems to be divided ideologically. And top professors in the top universities of the world say that there will be a clash of these ideologies. And it seems as if the politicians of the world are taking up this issue. On the other side, we have another divine mission driving Iran's new leader. And uh, we read this in the, the Telegraph in 2006, President Muhammad Ahmadinejad. The ultimate promise of all divine religions, says Ahmadinejad, will be fulfilled with the emergence of a perfect human being, the 12th Iman, who is heir to all prophets. He will lead the world to justice and absolute peace. O oh, mighty Lord, I pray to you to hasten the emergence of your last repository, the promised one. This is mega stuff. You know, the Bible talks about wars. We've seen that. Well, is this a possible rumor of things to come? A great clash of ideologies, perhaps? We cannot say that it will be so, that it will not be so. But Walter Lippmann already said, let no one deceive himself. We are drifting, we are drifting towards a catastrophe. Well, the Bible says there will come a time of trouble such as never was. So we do not have to speculate on these issues, something will trigger it, whether it be the current situation or not is irrelevant, it will happen. But look at the, look at the situation as we have it today. What we see today is an absolute fulfillment of what prophecy is speaking about. The table is laid. The issues are there. All that needs to happen is for the role players to fall into position, and all of these things will culminate and come to fruition. So there are rumors of wars. People are afraid. What is coming upon the world? There will be an increase in knowledge. Daniel 12, verse 4. What amazing signs the Bible gives. There will be an increase in demonic activity. Revelation 16, 13, 14. Everywhere in the world... People are channeling information, channeling information, and the book of books is more and more being sidelined. Legislations are being passed all over the world which directly contradicts that which is said in the Bible. And people are saying, set it aside, set it aside. We need to have a new introspection. Increased demonic activity, departures from the faith, 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. Economic woes, we've seen them, James 5, 1 to 8. Rise in false teachers, 2 Peter 3, 3 and 7. Increase in traffic and speed, that's an interesting one, Nahum chapter 2, verse 4. Disobedience and anarchy, 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. It doesn't take great intelligence to see that all of these factors are here right now on a global scale, and this is the issue not localized scales, on a global scale. But thou, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Daniel 12, 4. This includes knowledge in the Word of God. This is the ultimate purpose of this text. But it also includes, of course, knowledge and science and technology, which makes it possible for us to even know what is happening on a universal scale. We are living in a world of scrutiny where we can see what happens on the far side of the world that very moment on our televisions. Satellites make all of these things possible. When the prophet Nahum wrote these words in chapter 2 verse 4, the chariots shall rage in the streets, they shall jostle one against the other and the broad ways, they shall seem like torches, they shall run like the lightnings do you believe that this is what he saw? Somehow I don't think so. I think what he really saw was something like this. Maybe he saw the highways of the modern systems and he saw the mega express trains as they raced through the world and the jets leaving their jet streams. That is what I believe that he saw. He was seeing our day. James 5 verse 7 and 8 says, Therefore be patient, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. You also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord 
draws nigh. We see on a global scale what might have been regional in the past. We see all of the issues concentrated into one block of time. I'm not that old, but I can remember in my youth when circumstances were totally different, when even the climate was different. How often do we hear people say, the weather has changed, the circumstances have changed. We have areas in my country where they used to plant wheat field upon wheat field upon wheat field in the past for as long as they could remember. Nobody can plant wheat there anymore today because the circumstances have changed. In this one generation, in my generation, be patient, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Luke 21, 28. We need to have a relationship with the author of the universe because he's not bent on our destruction. He came to save us. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearance. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. Study the character of Christ. Learn to fall in love with this character. And they will have no fear. There will be nothing to be afraid of. For the ju Father judges no man but has committed all judgment unto the Son. John 5 verse 22. If that judge is also my advocate, then why should I be afraid? This is the judge who created me, who was prepared to die for me, even though I was sinful. If I put my trust in him, there is nothing to be afraid of. So this is the good news, that the judge and the advocate are one and the same individual. Daniel 7 verse 13 and 14 says, And I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man, came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. What a tremendous promise. We have no fear if we believe in what God has said. Psalms 91, 7 to 9, A thousand shall fall by thy side, and ten thousand by thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. There's nothing to be afraid of if we trust in the Lord Jesus. Psalms 91 says, Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Psalms 91 verse 10. With these promises, why should we be afraid? As we look at all the issues that we have discussed, we can see all the pieces of the puzzle coming together. I believe the picture is almost complete. The time for this planet, the time of probation, is running out. And we are just before midnight, when the Lord will return with power and great glory. May the Lord Jesus be with us, and may we instill in us a mindset to trust Him and to believe His word, and none of us should fear and be lost.